This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Eldridge, welcome to Eldridge and Company. I still can't believe that the Speaker of the City Council, which happens to be the second most important and powerful office in city government, is a woman. Christine Quinn, the Speaker, has brought a new look to the Council, and I'm delighted that she's my guest today. Welcome. Thanks, Ronnie. So, didn't everybody say, well, she, how could she be Speaker? She's a woman. Uh, you know, I did hear a fair amount of that when I was running. People would feel empowered, which is kind of rude, actually, to tell me I couldn't win because I was too liberal from the west side of Manhattan, oh, a woman, side. exactly, and a lesbian. All of which I knew when I woke up that morning, right. you know what I mean? And they and knew it also. Exactly. Those and so guys. I figured, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but if you don't run and try, you never know. Fabulous. It is. So do you still get a, a tingle, or now you've been doing it for a long time? You still but, do, though. I mean, not every minute of every day, but you do in ways that <laughs> are often kind of surprising. Yeah. And, and, but it's just, uh, we recently, which I hope you come down and see, redid the council side of City Hall, which Ronnie, you well know was a dump. Uh, and just to see it now and think about what right. has happened all over the years. I mean, my office was once Mayor LaGuardia's office when he was then head of whatever the city council yeah. was called then. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not lost. You so know? you're really part of history and it's a yeah. fascinating and a wonderful achievement. And then you got a father <laughs> who comes to work every day in the city council space yep. downstairs. He thought when an Irish person became speaker, would go back to Tammany <laughs> Hall and he would get, uh, you know, a no-show pay job. He has a show no-pay job <laughs> and comes to city hall, has a desk in the basement uh, every day. Do you think a man speaker would ever do that? You know, I don't know. I'd never really thought so. about it. I mean, the mayor was very close to his mother and talked about his mother a lot. I mean, she obviously lived right. in a different right. place. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think it would happen. I don't know. Do you think that you run it any differently? You know, I think people who are from communities that haven't had a seat at the table before, women, LGBT, people of color, disabled, I mean, there's a list, can run things differently. Not always, but can because you're mindful of not having been at the table. So I think you often have the doors a little wider, bring people in. One of my first bills as speaker was from the pre-existing council. And I said, oh, who was opposed to this bill at the hearing? And they said, nobody. I said, nobody? How could that be? It's a controversial bill. And the staff said, well, we, we don't really reach out to the opponents. Oh. So I was like, no, you have to reach out to everybody. And I actually think when you hear from the opponents, sometimes you make a bill you really, better. Yeah, you really do. Yeah. Now, I remember you when you, I guess maybe it was one of your first jobs. Right, the housing the justice housing job At housing justice. And you always sat, I was on the council, you sat in the front row and you took notes and you got <laughs> up and walked and you were this and you were organizing and you were doing everything. And you were a very tough advocate. Thank you. Now you've got the advocates talking to you. Yeah. Um, how does the role change and how do you feel about what you're doing? You know, um, it's interesting. It makes me a better speaker because I feel like sometimes when I'm listening to the advocates, and this past week, funny, we've been negotiating a bill with ANHD, which is the first mm. place I worked, so it's very funny. Um, you know, I feel like sometimes I can hear what they're saying and process it in a different way and kind of run it through the speaker part of my brain and say, wait a minute, what if we thought about it this way? Could we get there? And I think that's helpful because um, I can kind of look at things both how I would have looked at mm -hmm. it if I was in their seat and how I'm looking at it in this seat. And I think that's why we've been sometimes able to find creative solutions. Does it cause you some problems with your former, with your friends from old days? Sometimes. I think you're just uh, giving in. I Sometimes. Mean, the expectations, I think, of, of people who are advocates, whether it's community advocates or issue advocates. Yeah, is I mean. They've got a friend in there and now that friend is, I mean, it's actually it's the same thing as Obama. Yeah, and it can be, it can be challenging. You know, early on there was an effort to, or an interest in expanding, um, uh, HIV AIDS Service Administration, which used to be Division of AIDS Services, 
to more New Yorkers and for a longer period of time, not folks who technically had AIDS, but folks who were HIV positive. And I'd done a lot of work around that issue, as you remember. Right. And I was afraid that if we extended that extra service, we wouldn't have the money to keep, keep it. it. And we ended up, I was right, unfortunately, I wish I was wrong, and that caused a lot of tension. And my concern was if we spent that extra amount of money on HIV prevention that way, was it the best way versus other ways? And that was difficult. You know, I felt like we had the same goal, but yeah. the advocates and I saw a different way of doing it. But you know what? I still think it's better to have kind of a constant conversation, total dialogue. And you can't always agree. You had a recent thing with the living wage. Yes. I'm sure everybody thought, well, Chris will be. It's in the, right. know, what, what do you call it? It's in your pocket or right, whatever. Right, in the bag, right. In the bag. Uh, but it's what you have to, I guess, you negotiate. You're a very good negotiator, I think, Thank aren't you. you? But that then leads to trouble and yeah. criticism. I mean, the living wage bill was very uh, interesting and a good learning experience because there was an effort we led at the council to try to see if we could get business and labor and community to agree. In the end, we didn't, but I still think it was worth trying. And I give Kathy Wilde and the partnership a lot of credit for saying, let's see. Mm -hmm. Not everybody would do that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that legislation, as we drilled down on it, it called for people who get benefits from the city to have to pay a higher wage, but also their tenants. But their tenants weren't getting any benefit from the city. So I had no problem and have no problem with, if I'm the city and I give you a benefit, you have to pay more. If you don't want my benefit, you don't have to take it, mm -hmm. and then there's no connection. But the idea of, of us and the government saying, you have to do something when I actually have no connection, when you've not taken any city money seemed unfair and to go too far. And most of the other jurisdictions that covered tenants did it on city-owned or publicly-owned property. So it wasn't a question of coming out of somebody's pocket. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. I think we've gotten a fair bill that we will pass next week. But we still need to do more, and that's why I really think the Economic Development Corporation should be prioritizing re the requirement of tenants paying a living wage, even if they have to restructure deals to add extra subsidies. And also that the original, is the what do you call the original receiver of the benefits? Uh, just the, the recipient, developer, yeah, the yeah. developer, whatever. And th they don't pass it along. Nothing, right? Yeah. That's the, so yeah. you know if you were related and you're building a building and the coffee shop rents a space, you, the coffee shop rent isn't going down, even though related But they pass it. along the tax, don't they? Uh, they don't, they pass around taxes, yes, in they the They pass upsets. it along to the tenant. Yeah, not in the savings. So maybe the tenant could get the tax Well, benefit. that's something we're looking at to try to figure <laughs> out. The state would have to do that. Yeah. It's interesting, we did come across a, a dynamic I didn't expect in this negotiation, which has worked out well for workers, is the new wave in real estate is to condo out commercial property. So the developer builds a 12-store building. And everybody owns their property. So if you are... They pay their own taxes. And if you're a business and you're condoing out oh. and buying, you're covered by the bill. Because you are the because you get the benefit. Right. So that we didn't expect, and that's a, a way we're going to capture a few more workers. So you've got a program for home ownership, I think, or home apartment renting and owning or something. Um, it could be this... I mean, you could do a Mitchell Hama kind of kind thing of for, right. for the That's co true. condos. That's it's true. Interesting. Yeah, that opens up all kinds of different concepts. Totally. Every day, something different happens, and that's why you really have to to be close to communities and to the advocates, because yeah. otherwise you don't find out. Right. Actually, today we earlier today I was at a press conference with A and H D and other advocates around banking issues, and we're going to pass legislation that will require banks that get cities deposits to, among other things, report publicly on all of their CRA data, small business lending, mortgages, et cetera, by census track. So we'll really have the info of what's happening in our communities and what isn't happening. And this recession has shown us how yeah. important that info is. And what are they complaining? You know, the objecting. banks were objecting, though we basically said we're going to do it. So either stay at the table and help us do it right, Mm. or not, and to their credit, they, uh, particularly some of the bigger ones, said, well, if you're going to do it, let's make sure you do it right. Remember when we first did the legislation for the uh, machines when you got out the money? Yes, the There's ATM something. and the and the, and the banks said the ATMs aren't centers, they're not centers of profit, so don't bother us. Anyway. I have funny, I talk about that bill every now and then because it was so hard, 
And but it was a great example of other stuff we yeah. can do. Yeah, it's interesting. It was yours and Walter's bill, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I got held up. Right. At that's the ATM. right. That's what started it. That's when I right. called the bank to tell them, they said, "Well, sorry, but we're not responsible for that." That's right. So it was really, it was a whole interesting thing. Um, do you feel that when you're governing that that you can always make a difference? Yes. Yeah. I think you can always make a difference. I think you can always make a difference. Were you born this way? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, my mom had been a social worker before she had my sister. My dad uh, was an electrical engineer but had been a shop steward in his union. Uh, and I read, the only books I ever read as a kid were biographies of political people. So I think all of it came together yeah. in a... A sense, and you know, my uh, my mother, my father too, but my mother, in a way, she talked about more, was a very religious woman. So she had a real belief that the impossible was po possible, that the miraculous was possible. And I think she, in ways mm. that I only realize now, uh, gave that concept to my sister and I. That's interesting. You know, yeah. Also, we were brought up in a, an age. I, I assume I'm sort of similar in age. Um, that that was a an important duty of, of citizens yes. is to participate. Yep. Oh, and absolutely. That we have to give something back to our communities and be part of it. And that seems to be gone. You know, it's gone, but it's, it's still there. Yeah. You yeah. know, I was at an event recently out in Brooklyn, and there was a student host committee at this event I was on, and the students yeah. were incredibly yeah, engaged and excited. And even today, uh, one of the papers was writing about we in the council gave a grant to a women's group called Holla Back that's upset about street harassment of women, and yeah. they're developing an app. So women can document when they're called names, where it happened. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we would never, you and I no, wouldn't have thought never. of that, no. <laughs> we, we couldn't even make a phone call. Exactly. Uh, so um, there, you look at some of these issues that are around and that we pay a lot of attention to. And, I, t you know, it's a deep sigh for me because I, these are issues. Right, they're not new. 40 years ago yeah. or something. So what are they, homelessness? Homelessness, daycare, daycare. daycare. housing. Daycare. Do you think now housing is interesting because you want to you want to produce more permanent housing right. for that's affordable. Yep. But you know they tried to do they did that with the Mitchellamas. Right. But what that why they didn't expand is that they didn't continue doing right. the developing right. it. You know so right. people go and they stay there and then there's no place for other people to go. Right. How do we do this? I mean, isn't this important also federally? It is. I mean, the, the, the challenge of affordable housing is there's no one easy answer. It's a big puzzle on the city and state level. So yesterday, the Supreme Court not taking up rent yeah. protection, huge victory. Right. We need to get rent protection back to where it once was in the city at a stronger level. We also need to push to get all the city housing programs to be permanently affordable. And we need to try to get more federal money because really what's going to help us save with the housing authority is isn't, to get more federal money. Yeah, we can't possibly take that under. But isn't that then going to come up against that very strong real estate lobby? You know, it's a mix. I mean, not every building that, that a developer wants to build is going to be permanently affordable. But there are developers out there who want to do that as part of their overall yeah. portfolio. They see, you know, the wisdom of having part of their portfolio be that. Aren't we on the cusp, don't you get the feeling with Occupy Wall Street, that we're on the cusp, cusp of saying to people, how much money do you really right. want? You know, I what are you going to do with all of these millions? I said recently at a panel about the presidential elections, if you think about it, Occupy Wall Street in making income inequality part of the public debate They've had more of an impact already than the Tea Party. Absolutely. Because all the Tea Party wanted was for things not to happen. Right. And Occupy Wall Street has, whether you like or don't like or are indifferent, they've injected something into the public discourse that might right. not, not have, have been, ever been. Right. And even when now with the stockholders meetings, I mean, yeah. even large groups right. that aren't individuals are saying, taking a look at it. So maybe there's hope if we really get that you know, that drive. Yeah. That's what I wanted to go back when you said that you have that drive and you believe you can always do something. Because I think it's those of us who are brought up wanting really to change the world. Right, right. That really always consistently push. You know, there are too many people that say, oh, that's, that's not possible. Yeah. You're not going to be able to move it. You know, I think New York is a place that's full, a lot of, full of a lot of people who think you can push and make a difference. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of New York's DNA. You know, there was a story in the paper a week or two ago about Jackie Rowe Adams, a woman who is head of a group called Harlem Mothers Save. She's lost two of her three sons to gun violence. And she, Harlem Mothers Saves, is mothers who've lost children mm -hmm. to gun violence. 
she runs that group. She helps those women. And she went a couple weeks ago to the NRA's National Conference. It's amazing. And got in the face of the vice president of the NRA. And the thing that was most remarkable is she kept talking to him and pushing him and pushing him. And what she left that event with was a belief he was going to help her. Now, is he going to help her? Is he not? Who knows? But that's somebody. That's the beginning. Exactly. And it's at least. Exactly. Yeah. And that she still, after all her loss, sees the world with hope and potential mm -hmm. makes everything possible. Because if she can, and what? We all, we have no, none of us have any excuse. Well, and you've seen in your, in your recent years the changes. I mean, look at gay marriage. Exactly. Who would have ever thought when you and Tom Duane were in the city council that this would have worked. happened. Nobody would have thought. They and when I worked crazy. for John Lindsay, right. that was the beginning of, yep. of the whole thing. And it's amazing. You were, were, you, were you the first LGBT yeah. liaison? So yeah. you probably just called you the gay liaison then. Yeah, I was. <laughs> I was the person that this guy came to talk to me, Mark, uh, R Mark Rubin. Mark, uh, he recently died. He was a school teacher and he had been married and had two children and now. Right. And he came and told me about what was going on. I mean, gay people couldn't walk down the street three right. abreast without having the cops stop them and ask for a parade permit. Oh, God. And that was, it was a year after Stonewall. Right, right. And then we, we had all the demonstrations. We did everything. And then John Lindsay issued an executive yeah. order. So Which now, really started kind of the started whole the thing. Started the whole thing. Now yeah. it was the Gay Activist Alliance. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Some people used to call me and say, they're going to get arrested tomorrow. Please watch over me. <laughs> oh, wow. And you so, did. I did, yeah. Uh, they still call. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the other day, it was a little bit ago, I come into City Hall and there's this huge place, plate of peanut butter homemade cookies. I said, where are those from? They said, oh, so-and-so that you helped get out of jail brought us the cookies, a <laughs> yeah, similar right. kind of a thing. Well, it, that's going to bring me up to another subject, but I just wanted to get this over. The, the gay marriage, so you're going to get married. Yes, in next month, May 19th. Is it going to be a big one? Well, you know, we're, a we're private wedding. Yeah, it's gonna be private, though. You know, we, as you know, a lot of my friends are political, yeah. so there'll be political people there. I think it'll probably be around 250 or so, maybe 250. Oh, I know. Well, Kim comes from a big Italian family, so a barbecue is 30 people. Yeah. You know what I mean? For no reason <laughs> at all. So uh, then you grow on top of that. But we're very, very excited about it, and gonna have a lot of family involved in the ceremony and stuff like that. So it'll be nice. So being the first woman who came head of a city council, um, also the first gay right. person. You, it's all so mo melded in your life, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you don't think that, first of all, of being a woman, or you don't think, first of all, of being gay. No. It's just you. Yeah, it's just all that. Uh, you're, uh, it's funny. I said to somebody recently, we were talking about St. Patrick's Day Parade and the not marching. I said, look, I'm a package deal. You know, I don't come a la carte. You get the whole thing, Irish gay woman all together or not. It's up to you. Yeah. And so that's it. Yeah. And it makes it very comfortable. Yeah. 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 It's terrific, yeah. but you're not going to tell me what you're going to wear. No, a dress, right. but that's all. <laughs> when you talk about um, children and pre-K and the need for education, mm -hmm. you're talking about a lot of support in communities. Mm -hmm. And you, you say the city is a whole group of communities, right? You know, they do the same thing with people coming out of prison. That's true. With people coming on. It's the need of that more decentralized kind of thing. It's a very interesting concept. So uh, tell me what... Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting because there's some pre-K is in schools, but some mm -hmm. is with community groups mm -hmm. like, you know, Hudson Guild and other places that you know well. And we want to make sure we continue to have that neighborhood infrastructure because then right. that creates the potential for whether you need programs for people just out of prison or seniors or whatever for that kind of one-stop shopping to be there in neighborhoods. And one of the things we have to be careful of right now is a lot in our, because we don't have as much money as we would want, we're cutting back on funding based on things like zip codes. But in somewhere like Chelsea, we could lose funding hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for the Hudson Guild because it's in a high income zip code. But there's a Nork, there's a public lot of housing. rent protected, two public housing. So we kind of have to have a deeper understanding of neighborhoods mm -hmm. to make sure we're not, and look, you have to cut somehow if you have to cut, but that you're not destabilizing neighborhoods with some rubrics that seems easy because it's not easy it's incredible to believe that every child who wants to go to kindergarten can't, can't go, go. Right. It's just incredible right it's and in, and and in some it's three percent citywide but that don't go uh three to four percent but in some neighborhoods it's 11 percent and it's what advocates of children have documented that it's mostly immigrants 
foster kids, English language learners whose parents homeless. may homeless and their guardians or parents may just not know that they can't be turned away. And they're the kids that need to go. Absolutely. I mean, all kids need to go. But they really, really right. need to go. But why do you think we haven't been able to institutionalize in a better way child care, early childhood care? You know, I don't know. Do you think because it's thought of as a women's issue? Um, I think that's historically historically that's part of it. Yeah. And I think because we we kind of chop kids up into sections. Do you know what I mean? Like we we think about what happens when they're five or six and they get into school and we almost leave everything before that to chance and as an afterthought. And we've never really in this country stepped back and said from birth all the way through, and what do they need? And it's such a tender kind of thing that you need to pay attention. I mean, when you talk about the money you spend in corrections, right. and the money you spend in drug treatment, and the money, the number of people unemployed. If in fact, I always loved the name Ypsilanti, but how many years ago there was a study right. done in Michigan that showed the benefits of Head Start? Right. But why isn't that nationally? Because we don't pay the. So we really need a whole. You need to general start. change of priorities. And we need an real early education plan. Yeah. And I hate to say zero because it's like they but don't But we exist. also need the after school for the older kids because otherwise they're on the street. So it's interesting. Nancy Zimfer, who's now the chancellor of SUNY, right. was the chancellor of schools in Cincinnati. She really embraced a community schools model that looks at zero to 12th grade, looks at longer days, looks at after schools, looks at wraparound and how you involve community partners. We're working with her now, with the DOE, with the UFT, with CAMBA and others, on implementing a community school model in Astoria in District 30. Right. And I think we can show there, and it's struggling, District 30. We right. picked a tough place. When we implement the model there, and my staff was just in Cincinnati yesterday, I think we'll see exactly what you're saying. Because if we, if you and I were starting on day one, we wouldn't say, let's only do it starting at age six. Let's only do 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Right. Let's only do Monday through Friday. And let's have six different agencies. And then we always tell the single mother to go out and work. Exactly. <laughs> and, or she can't get her And welfare. be responsible for your kids. Exactly. exactly. And, and also with the community colleges and that whole a movement that it can really just go oh. right up there and then you have people who can get a job. Exactly, exactly. And that, you know, I think it was when, when you were at the council was the real push started to actually have daycare at the community yeah. colleges. Yes. Which, and last year I was the commencement speaker at the BMCC oh, great. graduation. The keynote speaker who was going on to a four-year four -year school had a little girl and used the BMCC daycare. Terrific. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, such an important thing. Excuse me. And it can make a big difference, and not just for that woman, but think about they brought her little girl up on stage. She had a party dress on, and you know Mary Jane's. And think of what that the <laughs> that meant to her. Exactly. The role model. Her mother now. was the speaker at the graduation. Exactly. In the Javits Center. So how do we make these programs? How does it? How do, what do we do to make it so that we can afford these programs? Well, I think we have to look first at where are we spending money in the budget that isn't as important as these things. You know, our contracts budget, which is not the contracts to nonprofits, has grown five times faster than any other part of the budget, growing. Everything else is basically being cut back. Is every outside contract with a consultant bad? No, but we don't need all of them. And they're certainly not as c good, most of them, as some of the core things you and I are talking and about. And then at, some of, at the same time, you hire the contractors that you contract at and you you get rid of the middle class, exactly. the people we depend on for the middle class structure in the city. So it makes no right. sense. And you'll remember when you were in the council and Mary Pinkett uh, was at head of GovOps, we passed Local Law 35 that required that the city do a financial yeah. check. They disregarded it, so we did an update of it that tightened the loopholes that uh -huh. probably were unintentionally in there and makes it harder for them and now really is going to force the city to do that financial analysis to see, is it going to save them money? by contracting out. So some people say you're thinking about running for mayor. <laughs> Ronnie's been talking to my father. <laughs> I definitely have. And I also have heard, yeah. heard the murmurs around. Exactly. Um, do you, and people, what fascinates me is some people say, oh, she has, a, she, you know, all she's done is follow Bloomberg. But then when you begin to think about it, and what, what we talked about earlier yeah. about the need to negotiate and to compromise, and I read someplace that you said, well, Part of that is due to the way the newspapers and the media reports it, yep. because if you don't get the confrontation, it's not an interesting right. story. Right. So what's been your experience? I mean, I think, look, the media likes that story. They like mud wrestling. Yeah. It's an yeah. easier story to write. And the idea of people who are trying to agree, 
trying to find commonality, bringing people together, and then when they can't, disagreeing agreeably, it's not as good of a headline. And I, I think there is a pushback from the media on that. They almost would prefer the mayor and I to fight. But, you know, this past summer one day I was walking the dogs, and these two gentlemen stopped me, panicked about the debt ceiling, two construction workers. I thought, these guys shouldn't know what the debt ceiling is, and they were worried sick about their parents' Social Security. That's better than people who are trying to agree, and when we can't, just disagreeing agreeably. You know, we're... So you're talking about all the dissension in Washington. Yeah. And who yeah. does that help? It hasn't helped anybody. No, and it just makes people anxious and nervous. And life makes you anxious and nervous enough. We in the government don't need to add to it. Right. And I, but I think that's, you know, that was a typical story of the council versus the mayor. The press likes Absolutely. that story. And but, you know, my job's not to make stories easy. <laughs> Would I be successful in your administration? You would be a standout <laughs> in the Since Catholic. I was always saying no, I don't know. But you know it's what, it's interesting. interesting. Kind of thing. When I became speaker, I thought a lot about things you uh, were unhappy about when you were in the council. So we now have, the week before every stated meeting, we have one today, a Democratic caucus. Okay. We go over everything we're voting on. Because I remember how frustrated yeah. you and Tom would get. You wouldn't even know what was we on the agenda. Yeah, we didn't know anything. And I thought, I never want to hear anybody say, they didn't know in advance. And, and that really came from, from you and Tom. And, you know, the budget negotiating team, we yeah. always go back to the delegations. Right. Three delegations can override the budget negotiating team. It would never have been like no, that. never. And never. so your, what well, you and others raised, we've really tried to embrace. And council members feel they have more power. Yeah, and, and they're now, representing their districts. The rules of the council are a chair can put whatever they want on the agenda. Yes, I read that. Yeah, you yeah. used to have to go with the I was speaker's shocked. office. I, right. Somebody said to me, stop this hearing recently. I said, I can't. Yeah, right. Thank goodness. Yeah, right. right. Well, thank you, Chris Quinn. Thank it's you. Been terrific. And I'm going to read all the positive things that come out in the newspaper. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.